Jesus. There's something about that name. I mean, it's hard for us to, some of us, to let go, but man, Jesus, the name that is above every name, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Jesus, the name that drives out darkness, that brings down walls, that heals diseases, that makes a way for us going forward, is the name of Jesus. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to Romans chapter 6. We continue through this letter that Paul penned. Been trying to decide if I'm going to read all this to you or just pick a verse. Romans chapter 6. Is everybody doing good today? Everybody having a good day? Yeah. 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 It's a good day. But it's been a day in my little old, small little old world. I started at 4 o'clock, 3.30, what I thought I was going to start at about 8 this morning. Praise God. It is the Lord's day, not my day. Romans chapter 6, verse number 15. We'll begin reading till you get tired of listening, then I'll stop somewhere after that. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin... You became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of, that you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pray with me. Father, we love you. Thank you, God. That you love us, Lord. I simply ask that you would anoint this time, Father, reading of your word. That your word would come alive. That we wouldn't get caught up in all the wordiness of the scripture, Lord. But it would come alive and it would speak to our hearts, God. That it would touch us. That it would change us. That it would lead us in the direction that you're calling us to go. We need you, God. Draw us closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a powerful word tonight if we're willing to hear it if we not be offended because it's pretty much in our in our face but basically kind of the the subtitle for me is this grace is not a license to sin grace is not a license to sin so in romans 6 well basically all the romans the letter to the romans it's been leading up early on and he's been he's been setting this up paul's been setting up in the first part of romans that we are all saved by grace aren't you thankful for grace grace is good we're nothing without grace we can do nothing we can get nowhere without the grace of God he he begins setting it out talking to the 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 religious people that were you know thought they had it going on and he, he's made this case early on that no matter what you've done no matter how good you are no matter how many good works you are no matter how many checks you have on the list None of that is going to be good enough. It's only by the grace of God that you're made right. And on the other side of the spectrum, it doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter how far out to left field you've got or how messed up you were, that God's grace is enough. His grace is sufficient. We read a couple weeks ago in Romans 5.20 where it says where sin abounds or where sin increases, grace increases all the more. In other words, God is always bigger than whatever our issue if we are willing to turn back to him he will cover it and in chapter 6 the last time we were here he began 
telling us that though grace is everything and we're nothing without it, that it's not a license to sin. It doesn't mean that we can just do whatever we want because the grace of God is going to take care of it. You know, last time we discussed, if you were here, we talked a little bit about being a little bit, sounds a little bit morbid, but being dead to sin, Paul said. And, and I just say this, not meaning to be funny, but dead people don't sin. Okay, they just don't. And you and I need to learn how to be dead to some certain sins in our life instead of messing around with it. Because how many of you know, if I took, I mean, if we're honest, we play with sin. Like it's something to be played with. Like it's a toy to every once in a while see how close I can get to just get a little, my game on a little bit. And we don't realize and we don't understand that instead of us playing with sin, sin is playing us. And it's leading us down this destructive road that gets very difficult to get off. And it leads us a bad way. We talked about, we used the, the example of bad, baptism. It describes perfectly in, in Romans 6 when it says, Listen, we follow Christ in baptism under the waters that we be buried with Christ in His death so that we then be raised with Him to newness of life. Because of His resurrection, we need to get rid of some stuff. We need to get away from it. And we often mess with this stuff. And it turns out controlling us if we don't get away from it. We ended last time in verse 14, but Paul was encouraging. And he says, I'm telling you, sin is not your master. Don't let it control you, for you are not under the law, but now you are under grace. In other words, we don't have to be controlled by sin. You know, those urgings, those earnings, those yearnings, those things that, that have been so hard. We don't have to be controlled once we understand the grace of God and what Jesus did for us. We can be set free. We're set free from the law because why do we want to be set free from the law? Because the law proves to us that none of us match up. None of us can, can live up to this certain letter of the law, and that's why we need grace. Now, some people who are hypocrites, and they think they've got it going on, and they're all of that in a bag of chips, so to speak, and they, 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 they think they're the jewels that God gave the earth, you know, like they never messed up. But people that don't have a skewed thinking, we realize that we can never live up to the law. And so if we're going according to the law, it beats us down. Have you ever had the rule book thrown at you and you realize that I can't keep all the rules and we begin to get beat down? And then we hear about this thing called grace. And then we reach lost people and we're sharing them. Some of them have shunned and said, I've messed up too much and I've been too far out of here and I, I can't make it back. And, and we could try to convince people of this grace and we finally get a hold of this grace that no matter who you are or what, what you've done, that God loves you, that his grace swallows you up. But then the danger is this. We'll just do whatever because I heard about this grace and grace is going to take care of it. And so that's what Paul is really driving home tonight is the danger of this kind of attitude. Verse 15, he says, What then? Shall we, shall we sin because now we are under grace? Because God loves me? This I know because the Bible tells me so. So now does that mean I can just do whatever I want? And he's saying, shall we do this? And he started off the chapter with this same similar question. And the answer is a resounding no. He's saying, don't quit, keep living like you were living because God saved you and God loves you. He accepted you the way you are, but now he's asking you to move. He's asking you to be transformed into this new creation that he's called you to be. And so here's a real question for us to answer tonight. How do I present myself? Who do I present myself to or what do I present myself to? Think about it. Because in verse 16, Paul basically says this. He says, who are you going to present yourself to? Whoever you present yourself to, you're going to ultimately obey. And whoever you obey, you become a slave to whatever you obey. So, so my question is, what am I presenting myself to? What am I, what am I putting myself out there for? Because whatever that is, I'll be, I'll be, I ultimately will start obeying that. And he says this, here's your choices. He lays this out here. He says you are either a slave to sin and you're obedient to it, which leads to death, by the way, or you are a slave to righteousness, 
which is obedience to God, which you become righteous. You're either a slave to sin or you are a slave to obedience to God. So he gives them the options. He says, this is it. It's either black or it's white. We live in this world where everything's gray. It's a mixed match of everything and what people think and, well, this, well, that. No, it's not that way with God. We're either here, he says, you're either obeying sin or you're obeying God. It has nothing to do with if you're perfect or ever mess up. It has to do with which way am I heading, which, which lifestyle am I being obedient to and being led by. So he gives them the options, and then he speaks this prophetic word in verse 17. He says, here's the options. Now he says this in verse 17. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves... You were slaves to this thing called sin. Now you have been saved and now you have come to obey the word of God, basically. You've become now obedient to God. He, see, he's speaking this over them. He's giving them the options, but then he's imparting this word to them. But thanks be to God. You may not feel like it right now. You may have made a mistake today. But thanks be to God that you're no longer a slave to this thing. You don't have to repeat tomorrow what this, this thing that you did today he begins reminding them who they belong to see we get mixed up in the world and to me that's the overlying theme of the whole book of romans letter of romans is who do i belong to because if we're in this world and i'm not sure who i belong to this is when i head this way one day and i head this way the other day and i get caught somewhere in between and i'm not sure and he's just reminding them that you were slaves but you no longer belong to that way of living you are now a child of God, and he explains in verse number 18. He says, you have been set free. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. You've been set free. You've been set free from sin and now have become slaves of righteousness. What do we present ourselves to? Because we are a slave to whatever we obey. We're a slave to it, whatever we're obeying. Understand, you were a slave to sin and even the things I really didn't want to do. How many of you, when you were younger, or how many at a point in your life, and you, you knew you didn't want to do it? You didn't want to do it. You didn't want to go there. You didn't want to. But everybody else was doing it, and you were a slave to it. And I didn't want to. And I knew it wasn't right, but I just, I got pulled into this thing. I got prayer pressured, whatever it is. But the reality is we were a slave to it because we didn't really understand yet the freedom that Christ came to give us. We didn't yet understand the power of God by his Holy Spirit that there's another option. I don't have to go the same way this fly's eating my lunch. I don't have to go the same way I need to get set free from this thing. He sets us free, but there's times we do things we don't really want to do. And then we discover, but wait a minute. I don't have to act like everybody else rode you on. I don't have to act like everybody else at the stock show. I don't have to act like everybody else that I go to school with because Christ has set me free. I was a slave to it. I couldn't get away from it. I couldn't get out from under it. I had to be accepted. I wanted to be cool. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be loved. But now I understand that God loves me and I'm set free from this thing. And I, there's, a, there's a better way. And so he, he's, he's using these terms, and, and we understand the concept of slavery, right? If we live in a country or a kingdom or a nation, which there used to be a lot of them, where slavery is legal. So if a slave gets brought in, and, and I'm bought by a master, I am legally bound to him. I am legally bound to him. Whether I like it or not, there's no escape. There's no working it out. There's no payment that can be made. I belong to this man. So that way we were with, with sin. But until Jesus came and paid the price, Jesus purchased us, purchased us out of the hand of the enemy, out of the hand of sin, and he set us free. He paid the price, the concept of slavery. He says, I'm speaking to you in human terms because your flesh is weak. He says, I understand this. I'm speaking a spiritual truth to you in these human terms so that you can understand to understand because the enemy is going to try hard. Even after you are saved and you've had your mountaintop experience and you had your little moment, still the next day, in the next week, in the next month, the enemy's not going to give up on you. And he's going to continue to come after you and he's going to continue to try to convince you that you're no good, that you're unworthy, you're not a good mom, you're not a good dad, you're an adolescent punk, you've screwed it up. He's going to try to tell you all this stuff. And if I don't know that I belong to him, he's going to keep coming after me. This is the difference between God and 
is Satan. One of the differences is because God is love and he says, I love you, but I'm not going to make you choose. I'll let you choose because I want it to be your choice, not because I'm making you. Satan won't let you go. Those things that keep coming after you, trying to drag you down, that's the enemy trying to keep you away from God because he knows that if you get a hold of this, he knows that if you choose to go all in with Jesus, man, God is about to do some stuff in your life that's going to bring detriment to the kingdom of darkness and he don't want to let you go he's pulling at you he's tagging at you he's trying to strip away your family and your work and everything in your life he's trying to destroy in the middle part of verse 19 he says for just as you presented your members as slaves to to impurity and to lawlessness which by the way resulted in further lawlessness What he's saying is this, you've tried the sin route. You've tried that route. If it was all that good, you wouldn't be in here tonight on a Wednesday night in the middle of June willing to see what the Lord might have to say. Right? I mean, we've tried the sin route. If it was all that good, we wouldn't be here. I certainly wouldn't because it wasn't that good. We've tried the sin route and we found out that it lead to lawlessness. It lead to mess up. In the middle of my mess up, I realize I'm a mess up. So I figure I might as well go a step further in this mess up because it really doesn't matter at this point. And we just get further and further away. It's a big lie. It's a big conspiracy until we get where we just say, what difference does it make? The end of verse 19, he says, now try this. You've been that way, now try this, presenting your members as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. He says, try this, present your ways as slaves to God, of doing what's right. I'm not doing good because I'm good. I'm not doing good because I've got it all going on. I'm doing good because the one that I belong to is good. To the one that purchased me. The one who hung upon a cross so that I could be free. I'm trying to do good stuff. Not to be about works and not to show that I'm good. But I'm doing it because I belong to him, man. There comes a point where we have to decide. There's no, there's no choice in this. And I'm getting ahead of myself. But he purchased me, man. And so I belong to him. Again, remember, a slave has no rights. We've been a slave to the world. Why not consider ourselves a slave to sin? A slave to sin, which he says this leads to sanctification, this churchy word. But sanctification just means this. It means to be made holy. It means to consecrate. It means to pull you out of the junk and the mire and the clay and set you on the rock for your feet to stay. To pull you out of that place and take you somewhere else. it, It begins to make you appear and you become better than you really are. For an example, me preaching the Word of God, me praying with people, expecting God to do something. Hey, I can't do that, but God makes it appear that I can. Simply as we walk obediently, one turtle step at a time, going forward, God begins doing something we can't do on our own. It's John 15. John 15, 1 and 2. This is because how many of you know we always need pruning. Sanctification has to do with a cutting away. It's like circumcision in the Old Testament. It's a pruning. John 15, 1 and 2, when Jesus says, I'm the true vine, my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that bears fruit doesn't bear fruit, He takes it away. And even the ones that do bear fruit, He prunes them to make them better. This kind of goes with discipline. This kind of goes with some of this stuff. But, but God always wants to sanctify us. He wants to change us. It's not so much me changing. It's God changing me. It's not you just changing willpower. I'm not going to do this. But it's following God and He begins changing you. He begins taking things off you. He begins pruning you and casting them away think about it you don't quit cussing because you think i'm never going to cuss again the first thing you'll do when something happens is cuss but the closer i get to jesus and the closer i start following him pretty soon i start thinking my mindset is different the things coming out of my mouth is different he's doing the work but the more i follow him he starts cutting off lust he starts cutting off uh, all this kind of immorality and all this filthy it's all of it man he does he but the point is he starts doing it i'm willing but my goal is to follow him i'm seeking first the kingdom of god i'm not seeking first to quit doing one of these specific things but i'm seeking to follow him and as i follow he begins removing and when he begins removing them they're gone forever amen 
And that's what we have to understand, that he's purchased us, and as we follow him, it all happens through obedience to God. This is an act of his grace. Us being willing, us fighting the good fight, but him doing the the miraculous. Him doing what we can't do on our own. Obedience. Somebody say obedience. Obedience will take you places that nothing else will. Obedience will take you places where only good intentions will dream of. You can have all the good intentions in the world, but if we never step, if we never walk in obedience. But when we start walking in obedience, it opens doors and takes us to place that we would have never got without it. So in verse 20, he he continues addressing it. And he says, listen, as a slave of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. In other words, you didn't have an option. You couldn't get to righteousness. It was no concern of you. Let me ask you this. And I'll ask you as he asks us, what benefit... Were you deriving from some of those things in the past which now you're ashamed of? Can we be real? What benefit do you derive from the way you used to live? What benefit do you derive from the things you used to drink? What benefit do you derive from some some of those actions and and, and, and things that you were involved in that at the moment, man, this is good, yee-haw, feeling good, potty potty, you know? But then later on, why are we ashamed of it? If we come to church and there's a message is shared over a specific thing that I was a part of back in the dark days. All of a sudden, man, I'm convicted and it hurts because we're ashamed of those things. He says, why? What benefit? He said, rather, the, the benefits of righteousness are great. Those, th- those, those benefits were nothing. The outcome was zero. It was death. But the stuff from God is great. He begins speaking over them prophetic. I say prophetic. As he, as he lays out the dark stuff, and then in verse 22, he tells them again. It's like he's speaking this word over them. I'm speaking this over you. But now, having been freed from sin, and you are enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, which is sanctification, which is going to result in eternal life. See, we have to speak prophetic over ourselves. Not, man, I'm terrible, I screwed up, I'm lousy. I'm no good. No. We have to speak the word of God. I may not be perfect, but God says, I've been delivered from that. This has no hold on me because Jesus has set me free. I confess this thing, and the word of God says where the truth is, the darkness cannot be. When the light shines in that place, it sets us free. And we have to start declaring some things over us, man. I'm not an orphan. I'm not a screw-up. I'm not sickly. I am chosen and highly favored of God. I am speaking it over. It reminds me, I love speaking to lost people, you know. And I don't mind sharing a word like this with lost people. You're a child of God. There may not be anyone in that place that is a believer, but we just believe like Paul. When you speak a prophetic word that's a truth in the will of God, that it might just stir something in somebody that will turn a sinner into a saint, that will turn a homeless into somebody that has a home in the Father's house. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And Paul's speaking this over them, that you are set free and you are now enslaved to God. Enslaved to God. This could have been the message right here, verse 22. There's four points. Number one, you're freed from sin. You're free. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're freed from sin. Why do I know that? Because you've been purchased by God. All you got to do is accept it. Nobody can make you accept it, but he has set you free. He has offered to purchase you. Number two is this. You are now enslaved to God. Look at it like you don't have a choice. Even though God gives us a choice, we need to have the mindset, and I'll talk about that in just a second, that we have no choice. I'm enslaved to God. Number three is this. It results in sanctification. Not my doing, but he just begins doing a work in me. As I walk with him, as I move with him, as I follow him, he changes everything about me. And number four, the outcome is this. It's eternal life. It's a future and a hope in this land and eternity that's going to be glorious that nothing that we go through here is going to be worth comparing. It tells us in Romans, this is a a lot about mindset. This was Paul's mindset. I don't know if you know this about Paul, but he's a little bit militant. I mean, he just goes at everything full bore the other way. He said, I'm talking to you in human terms. We know that we have a choice. God is is a gentleman. He allows us to have a choice. But Paul is saying this, because of our weak flesh... Let us have the mindset that there is no choice. There is no choice. When we get to the point where we say, this is no longer an option for me. I'm no longer going to go there. I'm no longer. I cannot. 
Because as a child of God and the light residing in me, I simply cannot dwell in this dark place. I can't go there. I'm not going to justify it. I'm not going to try to work around it. I'm not going to try to explain it to people that don't understand. But some of you know what I'm talking about. We have a weakness. We have a thorn. And we simply cannot go there. Because if we go there, there's a good chance that we're going to get stuck. It's going to tangle us up and it's going to pull us back. And we're going to head back the direction that we've been delivered from. Does that make sense? It says, have the mindset that there is no choice. God purchased me. I will obey you, God. I'm going to live for God. The old man and the old ways are gone. If we would just get this mindset that I'm not the same anymore. We have to, I mean, it's like convincing people sometimes because we're wrestling with this whole trying to be good, but I'm not good, and I'm not sure, and I don't know if God really loves me, and I don't know if I'm really forgiven. Instead of understanding that Jesus died, man, he said it is finished on the cross, I accept it. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the new creation has come, the old is gone. Man, I'm not the same anymore. Until we learn how to renew my mind and let it soak into my heart and my spirit, I'm going to keep wrestling with this sin and wrestling with this filth which I've already know removes life from me. And I want to tell you that this is not about preaching a pep rally or trying to get people to feel good or bad about sin. I'm telling you the stakes are high in this thing. They are high, man. I've seen it a lot recently just with people I've prayed with and people uh, not only here but just in my life. The stakes are high. And that's why Paul pushes hard. And that's probably why, you know, maybe I push too hard for some people. But I just know this. I've always said this. If I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss this way. I'm not going to miss saying I didn't, I didn't push them enough. I, I, I was too soft. I was too easy. I was too whatever. Paul's pushing hard because Romans 6.23 says this. Bottom line. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. You hear that? The wages of sin is death. Paul knew Galatians 6 verse 7. He says, don't be deceived. The enemy is going to deceive you. The world's going to deceive you. He says, don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. You're going to reap what you sow. Whatever a man sows, he is going to reap. You can't get around this verse, man. We can justify, the world can justify, well, everybody else is doing it, and this is just the way I was brought up, and this was just the way I was born, and this is just what happened to me, and so I'm this way, and so we wrestle with life, and we turn it all into this mixed mash of gray areas, and you can live like this, and it's okay, because God loves you, and all this stuff, and then you filter it through this scripture, and it says the wages of sin is death. And whatever you reap, you will sow. We can have all the grace, but if we're living a way that says, I'm obeying this other stuff. If I'm obeying this stuff in my lifestyle, not that I don't ever mess up, but if I just keep going this direction, I'm not going to escape it, man. And if we're teaching a gospel to a culture and a generation that says you can live however you want to live, you can do whatever you want to do, you can do it all because God's going to love you, I fear that we are leaving, leading society and people because we have too many churches that are worried about that maybe somebody with a little money is not going to show up next week and so we don't preach the word of God and we are being false prophets and we are leading a culture astray we're like a bunch of blind people that are leading other blind people and Jesus says how can the blind lead the blind unless they all fall in a pit I'm telling you I don't know what I'm telling you but God is grace and he is love but there's a point that we have to walk in obedience to what he's saying. If God set us free, well, our response would be, I want to obey you because this is so much better, man. Better is one day in your courts. Man, I lived all those years, but the day I fell on my knees and began to cry out to God, that was the best moment of my life. And it didn't make sense. And it sure, it looked ugly, man. But that one moment was better than all the other days. And I'm not going back. And I'm not willing to stumble. And I may mess it up tomorrow but I'm telling you my heart is I'm going to follow Jesus I'm going to walk in obedience because I want to live as a child of God and not be led this other way because it is easy if we allow it to be an option to stump our toe and fall down and end up in a place that we can't get out of 
Thanks be to God. <laughs> ah, music team, I'm done. You know where I'm at. Simple tonight. If you need prayer, come, let's pray. But the question is this, and it's no different than God said to Moses and the people in Deuteronomy. And he said, I set before you a blessing or a curse. I set before you life or death. And he tells us again tonight, what do you present your life to? What are you being led by? What are you a slave to? What are you obedient to? Because this is going to give you the answer. And we have the choice. We've been purchased. We've been set free. So that we can walk to him. Let us make ourselves a slave and obey him. Is it easy? No. Not all the time. But man, it's good. Man, it's good. We're just going to keep walking. We're going to keep obeying. Do I understand it? No, not really. Not all of it. But we're just going to obey. Am I going to try to do it? I'm going to give my best effort, but I'm just going to follow him. He does it. I've seen him do it. Pray with me. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us, God. God, we never want to be beat up, and I never want to beat anyone up with your word, God, but I pray that your spirit would pierce our hearts and we would understand what's at stake. We would understand us. We would understand the generations coming after us, God, and we would be willing to hear your voice. And we'd be willing to look at ourselves and say, what am I obeying? Which way is this leading me? Is this honoring God? Or is this another way? Or is this a way that is leading me astray? God, I just simply ask that you would move in this place, God. That you would give us courage, Father. To understand that what we reap, just so. God, you sowed so Jesus so that we might reap life. God, because of that life, I pray that you would give us strength to be courageous as we walk in obedience to you. None of us are perfect, God, but just help us to walk in you. Help us in our inner man, God, to understand that you love us, that there is no competition because you purchased us. Let us accept that fully. And just say in our hearts, we belong to God. There is no more competition. There is no other option for your good, good father. Father, just pray that you move as we close in worship. We thank you. We love you. If you need prayer.